If you want to stand out during a back-end software engineering interview, you need to have great technical stories that demonstrate your skills. Sometimes you get those stories from your previous jobs, but if that's not the case or if you're at the beginning of your career, the next best approach is to just create those stories yourself by building great projects. In this video, we're going to explore five uncommon project ideas that you can do to grow your knowledge and expand your skills. For each project, we're going to cover three areas. The context of the project, the scope of the project, which is exactly what the project should do and should not do, and the learnings that you should get from it because each project should be perceived as a learning opportunity which deserves time and effort to become a success story on your career roadmap. For all projects you don't have to come with new solutions yourself. A lot of work has already been done by other people so most of your effort will be on research to understand how things work and on implementation to bring those solutions to life. So let's jump into the actual projects. Number one, a custom Kubernetes scheduler. Kubernetes is the best container orchestration platform out there. It's used by thousands of companies around the world and it has a strong open source community around it. You can be a backend engineer nowadays without getting your hands dirty with Kubernetes. Inside the Kubernetes control plane there is this critical component called scheduler which technically takes pods that should be created and assigns them on worker nodes by considering cluster load, pod scheduling restrictions and many other aspects. Now Kubernetes is a framework which means that it allows developers to extend it and this includes the scheduling part. So in other words you can create your own scheduler in Kubernetes where you can implement any scheduling logic that you want. In a simplified way, you can see the scheduler like that. It takes two inputs, the cluster state, which consists of the worker nodes and their current resource usage and limitations, basically how much CPU and memory is used in the cluster and how much is free, and the new pods that need to be scheduled. With those two inputs, the scheduler does its magic and outputs a mapping between a pod and the worker node where that pod should be scheduled. Now for this project, even though you need to research how the default scheduler works, you don't need to recreate it. Instead, you're going to make a simplified version of it and gradually add complexity. You can start with a simple scheduling policy that randomly assigns pods to nodes. Then you can start to incorporate configurations like pod affinity, which is a user config that expresses nodes preferred by a particular pod during the scheduling process. Then you can start exploring with a bin packing algorithm and then expand by thinking about load balancing the pods in the cluster, for example. Here's a good article which describes the scheduling setup in Kubernetes and a couple of scheduling policies that you can inspire from. Now, by the end of this project, you're going to learn a number of aspects. The process of integrating a custom scheduler in Kubernetes, how do you tell Kubernetes to use your new scheduler, the internal structure of the scheduler, which is the way you manage the inputs and outputs, how simple scheduling policies look like and what their limitations are, and the primary challenges of the scheduling process in Kubernetes in terms of performance. You don't need to actually reach those challenges yourself, you learn them by simply doing research in this space. Number two, a classical microservice based application. Now I'm sure that lots of you guys already know the main idea about microservices, but I'm not sure how many of you have implemented a complete microservice architecture from scratch. Drop a comment below if you did that and tell me how it worked for you. For this project, you can choose any application theme that can be implemented as a set of microservices. For example, a content recommendation system, a vehicle fleet tracking system, an e-commerce app, an IoT device management system, and others. Similarly, you can choose any tech stack that you want, including Kubernetes, which will definitely make your life way easier. The main idea of the microservices architecture is that you can split your system in a way that makes sense into fully independent microservices which have their own storage. The requests land into the system through an API gateway that routes the request to the appropriate microservice, and even microservices can exchange data between them to get a particular result. The scope of the project should be focused on the overall reliability and evolvability of the system because that's the hard part about microservices and what do I mean by that is to focus on scenarios like the following. If one of your microservices fails due to an out of memory or something, how would the system behave? The entire request should fail or it can continue to work partially. What if that microservice already did some write operations before it actually failed and this led to an inconsistent state of the system? How do you reconcile the state before the failure so you can bring the system into a stable form? How do you execute a transactional operation in your system? A transaction is basically an operation that spans across multiple microservices and if a request to one of those microservices fails, the entire operation should be rolled back so that the system state is always consistent. How do you allow a microservice to recover after a failure? Let's say you have a microservice that failed and you managed to fix the issue, but as soon as you deploy it, because there's a lot of traffic, it will just get flooded with requests and it fails back. How do you slow down their upstream traffic to allow the microservice to recover? You need to enrich the contract between two microservices. Basically, the JSON payload they use to exchange data needs to evolve in a way or another. You add or remove fields. How do you do that and what impact does it have to the deployment order of the microservices? Those are just a few scenarios that are meant to show you the direction where you should focus your efforts because this is the interesting part about microservices, not their actual implementation. By researching and implementing this project, you'll learn a lot of things. Here are just a few of them. 
splitting an app into multiple microservices, which is not an easy thing to do, it requires both system level and domain level knowledge to do it right, developing evolvable contracts between microservices, think about JSON or protopath payloads, develop a reliability oriented mindset, which is required to operate this kind of architecture in production environments, and many more learnings that you'll get by simply thinking and doing research on this project. Number three, a resilient multi-region CICD workflow. CICD stands for Continuous Integration Continuous Deployment, which is basically a workflow that takes your code from Git and ensures that it safely lands the infrastructure where it takes production traffic. There are a lot of tools and integrations that help you to build your code, to run tests, and then to orchestrate the deployment gradually in multiple environments, development, staging, canary, and production, with multiple checks in between that validates each deployment step. The multi-region detail is important because it adds a bit of complexity to the process. Lots of companies have deployments which span across multiple geographical regions, and think Thinking on how to deploy new code across regions is a great exercise to learn about configuration management, observability, and other aspects. In terms of the scope, in this project you don't have to build a CI-CD tool like Jenkins or Argo, but rather to configure them to obtain a full workflow. If you have a Kubernetes application, you can choose this combination of Jenkins for build, unit tests, and artifact generation, and Argo for integration tests and deployment orchestration. Feel free to explore and choose other tools as well, like Spinnaker, GitHub Actions, Travis CI, Circle CI, GitLab CI-CD, and many others. This project is a really great exercise to think about how important it is to have a reliable deployment pipeline because lots of issues may come up during a deployment. You're going to learn lots of things about the tools that you chose to implement your workflow, mainly around how to integrate those tools with Git and between them, for example, how to configure Jenkins to start an Argo workflow, how you define a step-based workflow and how you ensure that it works properly, how you design the workflow from a logical point of view, which is basically the actual order of the steps, how you configure the workflow to have a region-specific configurations and how they're applied when the deployment starts on a specific region, and of course, many other aspects around CI-CD area. Number four, a performance testing harness. Many companies have applications that need to respond to user requests very fast, usually in milliseconds or tens of milliseconds. Latency in these days translates directly into money since we have a very short attention span and if we see any lag on a website or a mobile app, we just switch to the next one. To be able to respond with such a low latency, apps need to be optimized for performance. That logic needs to be optimal from a resource consumption perspective. In other words, if you add some new code in your app that has a memory leak, which manifests after 10 days of uh, running your app in production, this is a very bad scenario because it's going to be very hard to catch that bug. This is where performance testing helps a lot. A performance testing harness is basically an isolated setup that can be executed manually or even integrated into a CI-CD pipeline, which simulates a high load similar to a production grade traffic and monitors the behavior of your app in terms of resource consumption to spot any memory leaks or other performance issues. For this project, you're going to build this setup by combining and configuring different tools which already exist for this purpose. The architecture for this hardness is quite simple. You have your app running somewhere, ideally in a cloud-based environment. You have a tool which sends a huge number of requests to your app. And you have a monitoring component which observes the resource usage for your app, CPU memory, maybe the number of connections to a database and other performance related metrics that you may need. For example, Gatling and JMeter are two components that can be configured in different ways to send a huge number of requests to an endpoint. You can configure them to send that traffic all at once or in different shapes and different volumes to achieve your test scenario. For the monitoring component, you can use Prometheus and Grafana, which are open source components used for exporting metrics from your application. By the end of this project, we're going to learn how different load testing tools work and how they can be configured, how you can automatically assess the resource usage of your application, how you can orchestrate different performance test scenarios and how you should design them, and many other aspects in this area of performance testing. Number five, an API gateway. An API gateway is the entry point in any microservice architecture, and by design, it has many roles. It does API traffic management, basically it decides to route a request to a particular microservice based on different aspects on the request. Authentication and authorization, array limiting, error handling and circuit breaking. It does caching to speed up the read performance. It can enrich the request with extra information, login and monitoring, and many others. This project is about writing an API gateway which replicates the functionality of the existing ones. It's technically a REST API which implements all the functionalities mentioned previously. The idea is to implement as many as you can. For example, caching may be fairly easy to implement with an in-memory cache like Fin, and also rate limiting can be done quite easily using a token bucket algorithm. 
The project complexity is given by the number of features that need to be implemented, don't necessarily their interesting complexity, or at least for a simple version of an API gateway. Now, when you finish this project, you'll have a pretty good idea on the role of API gateways and how their functionalities are implemented behind the scenes and what challenges API gateways need to address in a microservices architecture. So those were the five project ideas I believe to be really impactful and the great conversation openers in any backend software engineering interview. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.